Welcome to Julia for Talented Amateurs, where I make wholesome Julia tutorials for talented amateurs everywhere. I'm your host, the Dabbling Doggo. I dabble. Last week, we learned about algorithms and recursion. Today, we'll dive deeper into algorithms by examining some searching and sorting algorithms. Then we'll learn about program efficiency. The concepts in this tutorial are taken from Dr. Eric Grimson's MIT lectures. I took three of his lectures, and I've combined them into this one tutorial. For more detailed information on these subjects, please watch his videos. The links are in the description below. A good way to examine algorithms is to look at different searching and sorting algorithms. Two common searching algorithms are the linear search algorithm and the binary search algorithm. The linear search algorithm goes through every item in a collection to find the one item that it's looking for. The algorithm gets the job done, but it's rather unsophisticated. The binary search algorithm is more sophisticated. We saw an example of the binary search algorithm in action last week when we created a function using the binary search algorithm to find the cube root of a number. As a reminder, the binary search algorithm doesn't check every item in the collection. Instead, it splits the collection into two even groups and determines if the desired item is in group one or in group two. If it's in group one, then the algorithm discards group two. If it's in group two, then it discards group one. The binary search algorithm repeats this process until the desired item is located. Let's take a look at some examples. In Adam, open an untitled document. Move the REPL panel in between your untitled document and the workspace panel and adjust the vertical bars as necessary. Run your code by hitting up arrow, shift enter. Let's set up a collection of data in the REPL. Now let's try out our new function. This type of search algorithm is also known as a brute force search algorithm because it checks every single item in the collection. The benefits are that it's easy to implement, it doesn't care if the collection is sorted, and it will always find a solution. The downside is that it's not the most efficient. Even if the desired item is the first item in the collection, this algorithm will still go on to check every other item in the collection. A more sophisticated search algorithm is the binary search algorithm, which you saw last week when we used it to find the cube root of a number. In her lecture about cube root algorithms, Dr. Anna Bell plays a guessing game with one of her students, where she asks the student to pick a whole number less than 100, and Dr. Bell claims that she could guess it within 10 guesses. She goes on to use the binary search algorithm to guess the number in 6 guesses. A link to her lecture is provided in the description below. The catch is that the student had to give her feedback if her guess was too low or too high. You can play the same game at home with Julia. This code will allow you to select a number between 1 and 100, and Julia will guess it using the binary search algorithm. The catch is that you will have to give feedback to Julia whether Julia's guess is too low or too high.
Select all of the rows, including your markdown text, then hit Shift Enter to run your code. Click in the REPL to try out your new function. Enter question mark guessing game to see your markdown text. Now let's see if Julia can guess the number 42. Julia got it right. Try it yourself with a different number. This code comes from a website called Rosetta Code. Rosetta Code is a very interesting website. It maintains a collection of over 1,000 different tasks written in hundreds of different programming languages. On the home page, click on Explore Tasks to bring up a list of the various programming tasks. Click on any task, like 100 doors, and it brings up a list of all of the solutions written in different programming languages. Scroll down until you see Julia and click on it to see the solution written in Julia. This is a great site to learn Julia by looking at examples of different code. You can compare and contrast the Julia code with the code of various other languages so you can get a feel for the similarities and differences. Just a word of caution, some of the Julia code on this site is written using Julia version 0.6, so not all the code works. If you run into this situation, don't be disappointed. Just view it as an opportunity to use what you've learned in these tutorials to update the code to the latest version. A link to rosettacode.org is provided in the description below. As you might suspect, Julia has several built-in functions to help you perform your searching tasks. Here are some examples that you can use in the REPL without writing any code. Before we begin, move your REPL panel below the untitled document. Let's start by setting up our variables called haystack and needle. If you just want to search to see if your needle is anywhere within your haystack, you can use the in or not in functions. If you want to search for the index number of where your needle is located within the haystack, you can use several variations of the find function. This means that the first instance of your needle is located at index 3 of the array called haystack. This means that the last instance of your needle is located at index 5 of the array called haystack. This means there are two instances of your needle in the array called haystack, and they are located at indices 3 and 5. Find first, find last, and find all are examples of higher order functions. In computing, a higher order function is a function that takes one or more functions as arguments. In the case of find first, find last, and find all, the first argument was the built-in function is equal, which returns either true or false. The second argument was the collection of data to search. The find functions return the index or indices where the return value of the is equal function is true. Let's take a look at a few more examples of built-in search functions. This function returns a tuple with a minimum value in the collection along with its index number. This function returns a tuple with a maximum value in the collection along with its index number. This function returns a tuple with a minimum value and a maximum value, but no index number. OK, now that we have a feel for searching algorithms, let's take a look at some sorting algorithms. Before starting the next section, save your document as mysearchalgorithms.jl and close it. Create a new untitled document. Move the REPL panel below the untitled document. Type an exit in the REPL to start a new Julia session. Adjust the panel bars as necessary. The sorting algorithm concepts that I will be covering come from Dr. Grimson's lecture, but the actual Julia code comes from Rosetta code. The first example is called BogoSort. The idea behind the BogoSort algorithm is to take your collection of data and shuffle it randomly, like throwing a deck of cards into the air and seeing where they land. 
The BOCO sort algorithm repeats this process until it finds a collection that just happens to be sorted. IsSorted is a built-in function that tests whether a collection is sorted or not. The exclamation point before that function means to test the opposite of the function, that is, to test that the collection is not sorted. Let's test it out in the REPL. Amazingly enough, the BOCO sort algorithm was actually able to sort the data just by randomly shuffling it thousands of times. This may work with a small data set, but imagine how inefficient this would be with a large data set. Note that the BOCO sort is a permanent sort. Let's take a look at another example. This next example is called bubble sort. The bubble sort algorithm uses a for loop with a nested for loop to compare the values of adjacent items in the dataset. If the two values are not sorted, then the algorithm swaps their order. If they are already sorted, then the algorithm skips to the next pair. Let's try out our new function in the REPL. It looks like it worked. Let's take a closer look at what it did. The outer loop is just displaying the starting and ending results of the sorting activity. The actual heavy lifting is being performed by the inner loop. As you can see, the algorithm is going pair by pair to check if they are sorted or not. If not, then the algorithm swaps their location. If a pair is already sorted, the algorithm skips to the next pair. Because this algorithm has a for loop with a nested for loop, it has to go through all of those iterations even if there are no changes to be made. This algorithm is definitely more practical than the bogus sort algorithm but it's still inefficient due to the nested for loop. Note that the bubble sort algorithm is a permanent sort. This next example is called selection sort. It works by comparing the first item in the collection with the minimum value in the remaining items. If the first item is higher in value, then it swaps positions with the other value. If the first item is lower, then the algorithm skips it and moves to the second item. The algorithm then compares the second item with the minimum value in the remaining items and repeats this process until it has cycled through all of the items. Let's try out our new function in the REPL. The output looks cleaner than the previous two examples, but there's a hidden inefficiency here. It looks like the algorithm only performed nine steps, but what you're not seeing are the steps being taken by the findMin function. The findMin function is cycling through all the remaining items in the collection to find the item with the minimum value. The selection sort algorithm does take fewer steps than the bubble sort algorithm, but the selection sort algorithm also has some efficiency issues due to the findMin function. Note that the selection sort algorithm is a permanent sort. Our final example is called merge sort. Unlike the previous three examples, the merge sort algorithm uses a recursive algorithm. Recall from last week's tutorial that a recursive function is a function that calls itself from within its own code and the recursive algorithm requires two pieces. One, a base case, and two, a recursive case, which is a smaller version of the larger problem that it's trying to solve.
Let's try out our new function in the REPL. Hmm, that's interesting. Let's take a look at a diagram of what's going on. The algorithm is splitting the data in half and then splitting it in half again and then splitting it in half again until it reaches the base case on the left side. And then it sorts the base case and then merges them together. It repeats this process until it's done sorting and merging the left side. And then it repeats this process on the right side. Once the process is completed on both the left side and the right side, the algorithm then repeats the process one last time to sort and merge the two halves into one final sorted and merged array. While it may look very complicated, this merge sort algorithm is actually the most efficient sorting algorithm that we've looked at today. However, it too has a hidden inefficiency. The merge sort algorithm may be efficient in terms of the number of steps required, but the algorithm requires the use of intermediate arrays, which take up memory. Note also that the merge sort algorithm is not a permanent sort. There are many more sorting algorithms to explore beyond these four examples. Let's take a look at Rosetta code to see how many different sorting algorithms they track. As you can see, there's more than one way to solve this problem. 22 to be exact. As you may have suspected, Julia has some built-in tools to help you with sorting without having to write your own algorithms. Let's take a look at some built-in functions. This sorts the collection from low to high and is not permanent. This sorts the collection from high to low and is not permanent. This sorts the collection from low to high and is permanent. This sorts the collection from high to low and is permanent. This checks whether or not a collection is already sorted from low to high. In this case, it returned false because even though this collection is in a sorted order, it's sorted from high to low and not from low to high. This checks whether or not a collection is not sorted from low to high. So which algorithm is Julia using when using the built-in sort function? Julia actually has several different sorting algorithms at its disposal. It selects the most efficient algorithm based on the data type that needs to be sorted. You can actually select which sorting algorithm to use if you think that you're more clever than Julia. They may all appear to be the same with this small example, but the performance will be noticeable with large data sets of different data types. Now that we've seen a lot of different algorithms, let's switch gears and talk about program efficiency. Before we begin the next session, save your untitled document as mysortingalgorithms.jl. Close your document. Close out of Atom and restart Atom. As a hobbyist, I'm not necessarily concerned about program efficiency. For the most part, I'm amazed if I can get anything to work. However, just because something works doesn't mean it's any good. For professional programmers, getting something to work is a given. Their main concern is to ensure that the program that they've written is the most efficient code that they can generate. It's one of the many differences between a professional and a hobbyist. However, even as a hobbyist, I think it's important to know the concepts behind measuring program efficiency because being aware of them will help you improve your own craft. Here are some ways to measure program efficiency. One, you can measure it using a timer. We've done this before using the benchmark tools package. This is easy to do, but the result varies by the computer running the code. Two, you can count the number of operations. In concept, this sounds easy. But in practice, this becomes more difficult to do as the complexity grows. Or three, you can use an abstract notion of order of growth. 
Dr. Gribson argues that this is the most appropriate way of assessing the impact of choices of algorithm in solving a problem and in measuring the inherent difficulty in solving a problem. The concept behind using an abstract notion of order of growth is to look at the worst case scenario and determine how it grows with complexity, and then to classify it using the big O notation. In computing, the big O notation is used to classify algorithms according to how the runtime, or space requirements, grow as the input size grows. The growth rate of the function is also referred to as the order of the function, which is where the O comes from in the big O notation. There are many different classifications within the big O notation spectrum. We will take a look at five of them and then take a look at some of the algorithms that we've learned to see how we would classify them. This is read big O of log n, and its classification name is logarithmic. Algorithms of this classification do not perform well when the input size is small, but as the input size grows, the time requirement levels out. So these algorithms perform very well when the input size is large. This is read big O of n, and its classification name is linear. This is the base case for evaluating performance. Algorithms of this classification take a small amount of time for small inputs and take a large amount of time with large inputs. This is read big O of n log n, and its classification name is log linear. Algorithms of this classification take longer to complete with larger input sizes. For large input sizes, log linear algorithms do perform worse than the linear algorithms, but not as bad as the polynomial or exponential algorithms that we will see next. This is read big O of n to the power of c, and its classification name is polynomial. Algorithms of this classification do not perform well. The amount of time required to complete a task increases dramatically as the size of the input grows. This is read big O of c to the nth power, and its classification name is exponential. Algorithms of this classification do not perform well, regardless of the input size. However, its performance is especially bad with large input sizes. As its name implies, the amount of time required to perform a task grows exponentially as the input size grows. We can use the Machi plotting package to visualize the big O curves. This initializes a blank scene. This is the logarithmic class. As you can see, the logarithmic line ramps up fast in the beginning, but levels off as the input size grows. This is the linear class. This is the baseline class. Algorithms that perform better will appear below this line, and algorithms that perform worse will appear above this line. This is the log linear class. As you can see, it performs worse than the linear class, but not that much worse. This is the polynomial class. As you can see, the scale has shifted dramatically, and its performance is much worse than the previous examples. This is the exponential class. As you can see, its performance is just awful. Even the polynomial class looks okay compared to the exponential class. Save your plot. Now, let's take a look at the algorithms that you've written and classify them using the big O notation. Close out of Adam and restart Adam. This file is from last week's tutorial.
The binary search algorithm takes a little longer as the input size grows, but not by much. The binary search algorithm is an example of a logarithmic algorithm, so its classification is big O of log n. In the Wikipedia article on the binary search algorithm, you can see the big O notation listed in the side panel. Now you know what it means. This file is from earlier in this tutorial. You get the idea. The time required to complete the linear search algorithm grows at the same rate as the growth of the input size. As its name implies, the linear search algorithm is an example of a linear algorithm, so its classification is big O of n. This file is from earlier in this tutorial. The time required to complete the merge sort algorithm gets increasingly bad as the input size grows, but not terrible. The merge sort algorithm is an example of a log linear algorithm, so its classification is big O of n log n. Uh, yeah, that's bad. I had to hit Control c to get it to stop. The time required to complete the bubble sort algorithm becomes awful as the input size grows. The bubble sort algorithm is an example of a polynomial algorithm, so its classification is big O of n to the c power. You should try to avoid these algorithms if you can. This file is from last week's tutorial. As a reminder, this provides the solution of how to move 10 disks from rod 1 to rod 2 using rod 3 as a spare. That is the worst. The time required to complete the three recursive calls in the Tower of Hanoi algorithm become unbearably long as the size of the input increases. We couldn't even get beyond the input size of 100. I had to hit Control c to get it to stop. The Towers of Hanoi algorithm is an example of an exponential algorithm, so its classification is big O of c to the nth power. As you can see, not all algorithms are built the same. There are often many different ways to solve the same problem. Once you've mastered the basics of getting a program to work, you should then ask the question, is my program working as efficiently as possible? Well, that's it for now. Today, we learned about searching and sorting algorithms, and then we learned about program efficiency. Next week, we'll begin to look under the hood of Julia to get a better understanding of how it works. If you enjoyed this video and you feel like you learned something new, please give it a thumbs up. For more Wholesome Julia tutorials, please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell. New tutorials are posted on Sundays. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments below. Feel free to spread the word by sharing this video, since I'm sure you'll all agree that this is the finest tutorial on all of YouTube. Worst tutorial ever.